Good song. I already heard that one. Okay. So today we start, we launch ourselves into the third, second of three parts of the class. So up until this point, through the last roughly one month, almost exactly a month, welcome to fall, by the way. Today is the autumn equinox, which I discovered is actually not the day where there's an equal amount of sunlight and darkness. It's actually later this week. It's a day called the Equilux, but today is the equinox, the official beginning of fall, uh, a little bit of cool weather out there for us. So what we are gonna start today is the discussion of object-oriented programming that is gonna consume us for about a month. Um, again, this is a topic that builds on and layers on top of what you already know how to do. Objects you can think of as really a conceptual addition to our toolkit for how to write computer programs and how to com co communicate with the computer itself. Objects also represent a major step forward in our ability to work with data, and that's one of the things that's more exciting about them. Okay, so let's get started. Um, you know, and let me sort of also give you a little bit of a roadmap for the, the rest of what we're doing this semester. I can get the slides to advance for me. So these are the main things that we're gonna talk about. So, Algorithms. We've already started to talk about algorithms. When you guys work on a problem like how to reverse a string, essentially you're implementing a simple algorithm. That's fine. The algorithm itself is simple. Learning how to communicate it to the computer is the thing that you're struggling with right now. But as we go forward in this semester, we'll give you practice continuing to work on more and more complex algorithms. As you become better at getting the computer to do what you want it to do, we're gonna make the thing you're actually trying to accomplish more complicated. That'll be fun. Uh, data structure, so how do we structure data and work with data? And objects really are an addition to our ability to structure data. So we've looked at simple ways to store and, and structure data in our programs. Objects give us a much more powerful tool. We can actually design our own types and add them to Java's type system. All right, finally, um, these software development principles. And a lot of this will come out in the MP. We talk about this in class maybe from time to time, um, but this is something that you're gonna be learning primarily through your work on the machine project and the different machine project checkpoints that we have coming up. One of the things, I think I've mentioned this already, but I wanna reiterate that I'm really excited about the machine project you guys are doing this semester is that because it's one long project rather than a series of disconnected assignments, we actually get a chance to introduce you to things that you do in a real software development project that you normally don't do when you're just doing little one-off assignments for a class. So for example, refactoring your code. You learn about a better way to do something. If you go back and you fix the code you've already written, you rewrite it to use a more sophisticated set of idioms or concepts. That's something you guys are gonna have a chance to do on MP1, which is well-timed because objects are going to clean up some of the mess that you guys made in MP0. And I'll show you how in a few slides. All right, so we've talked about, we have some, you know, tools already here for how do we structure computer programs, breaking things down into smaller pieces. So we try to write functions that each do a single thing or at least can be tested, right? Uh, on some level, we're forcing this on you through our test suites because we're uh, requiring that you write your code in such a way that we can test it effectively. Um, now we're gonna get to this second thing, which is how do we model data? How do we model real world entities? Real world entities typically uh, have state. They have you know, a variety of different pieces of information that we might wanna know about them. They also do things. And object systems like Java's allow us to uh, model both of these components of real world entities, state and behavior, data and algorithm. We're gonna continue to get you guys to document your code properly. That's something that's a little bit more emphasized on MP0. And eventually, as we move forward, we'll have an opportunity for guys to use libraries and figure out how to do this as well. Okay, and then publish things, which we'll get to at the end of the class. When we start talking about objects, so this is kind of a fun point in the class, because this is one of the places where you start to get to use the right side of your brain. So roughly speaking, you're, well, Exactly speaking, your brain has two halves, but roughly speaking, the right side of it is more concerned with creativity, higher level thinking. 
The left side is the more logical step-by-step -step side of the brain. At some level, you might think of the left side as more like a computer, right? Computation is one of the things that's listed. Look at the things on the right side there. Holistic thinking, imagination, you know, dreaming, daydreaming, right? These are things associated with the right side of the brain. Programming, contrary to popular belief, is actually an activity that heavily utilizes both sides of your brain. You know, if you, if you could scan, you know, really talented uh, computer scientists, really talented programmers as they're working, I'm sure you would see both sides of their brain are heavily involved. Um, and objects are the first place where you actually start to get to some, make some of your own choices about how you're going to design things. You want to represent information about a position in space, or a person, or an animal, or a course that you're taking at the university. What information are you going to store? What are you gonna call it? How do you structure that information so that you can use it effectively? These are all design problems. There's no right or wrong answer to them. There are better and worse answers, but there are no right or wrong ways to do this. Okay, so Java objects begin to start to expose you to that part of computer science. So I, I find this a very kind of an exciting moment, right? Um, and we'll get a chance to, again, create some things together. Um, you know, imagine how we want to represent stuff and think about, uh, start to think more holistically about how uh, we work with things in the world. One way to think about it is, until now, you've had to content yourself with these eight primitive types that Java gave you out of the box. Now, you get to make the box. You can put anything you want in there. Objects allow you to design your own types and augment Java in any way you see fit. Okay, so what is an object? We've started to peek at them when we looked at strings. But objects are a concept that appear in a lot of programming languages. Java as a language is more centered around objects than some other languages, but object uh, orientation or objects as a programming construct appear in Python, they appear in Go, I'm fairly sure they appear in Rust, um, they appear as types in Haskell, they appear all over the places. And every language has a little bit of a different system for working with them, but roughly speaking, usually when we talk about an object in computer science, we're talking about something that combines two features. So an object has state. It stores information. Um, normally this, and, and this is actually one of the more powerful features of objects because it starts to allow us to model data more complicated data types than we can store with just our primitive types and sequences of our primitive types. But objects also, so there were existing, you know, back before objects started to become popular, there were existing languages that had a concept of something called a record, which was kind of a way of joining together multiple types of data to represent something more complicated. But Java's objects, and objects in general, also brought in this second feature, behavior. So behavior, so on some level, the way to think about this is state is sort of like variables, and behavior is sort of like functions. And objects unite those two things together, okay? So when we think about objects, we're always gonna talk about two questions. What does it store? What is its state? Objects allow us to encapsulate information. And when we design objects together, a lot of what we'll think about is what is the state that we want the object to store so that we can store the information about whatever it is in the world we're trying to work with in our program. And then, what does it do? What sort of functionality should it provide? So, let's think about strings, right? A string was the first object that we um, worked with in Java. It stores an array of characters. That's pretty simple. In many cases, the state that an object stores can be fairly simple. What gets interesting are all these different behaviors that it provides. Because strings, as you saw, if you, you know, have uh, even opened up the string documentation, have a lot of features that they provide. They can do things. They can search their contents for stuff. They can break themselves into smaller pieces. They can combine themselves with other strings, et cetera. So all those different behaviors are what make the uh, string uh, pretty interesting. And so on some level, objects are kind of, you know, objects are in the middle of this class, right? We talk about objects for the second half of the class, out of the three halves. Um, but the third half of the class 
we're going to talk about data structures and algorithms. And on some level, objects, and up until this point, you know, we've been talking about data structures and algorithms in a more simple way. Objects unite these two things together. So objects store data, and they implement algorithms. And these are kind of the two core concerns of computer science. Okay? So, here's the actual object definition. And technically, I'm using the word object a little loosely right now. Um, and we're gonna talk about a more, uh, we're gonna try to be more precise about this in a few minutes. Because technically an object is an instance of a class. A class represents an actual class of objects in the world, a certain type of thing that we're going to work with. An object represents one instance of it. So for example, person or student is a class. Every one of you is an individual student, an instance of a student, All right? So the object can be a combination of variables, functions, and data structures. And at some level that says an object can be a function of variables, functions, and combinations of variables. So really state and behavior, data and algorithms. All right. So let's introduce, so let's, let's start to be more precise with the terminology we use when we talk about objects. So a class represents a particular type of object. And again, now they're, you know, for example, I, was, I write a lot about Haskell this, this summer, and Haskell has a very powerful type system that's one of its more uh, important and distinguishing features. And classes in Java are like Haskell types. A type represents some type of thing in the world, right? So a type, all the things in a particular type are similar in some way. They all have common attributes, but they're also different. So each object, each instance of a class, can have different information, but there's something similar that unites all of them. That means that together they represent a class or a type. When you design a class in Java, and this is an example of a class definition, you are essentially creating a new type in the programming language. So up till this point, we've worked with ints and chars and strings and longs and, you know, just the primitive types, but now, we can design our own types. So here's an example of an object. This is a class declaration, okay? So this is a, this is a point. So the object part of this class, from a programming perspective, is not difficult. From a conceptual perspective, it's gonna challenge you a little bit, okay? So this represents a particular type of Java object, this class definition. This says when I'm working with an object that's of type person, that object will contain the following information. All right, so here's my class definition on line one. Class is another one of our reserved words in Java that we can only use here. So when I define a class, I start with the special keyword class. And then I give my class a name. And just like when we name variables and functions, we want that name to be descriptive, and when we name types or classes, that it's incredibly important that that name is descriptive. If I called this B, you have no idea what this is. I'm calling it a person. That gives you a clue about what type of information this class is supposed to represent, okay? So I have, now I have a block. And inside that block, remember we said objects, classes in Java unite state and behavior, data and algorithms, I have pieces of data, and I have method declarations, or algorithms. So the body of my class definition contains two things. It contains things that look like variable declarations. I've got one on line two and one on line three. The one on line two says every person also contains a piece of data that's a string that I'm gonna use the word name to refer to. You can guess what that is. Every person also has a piece of data called age that's of type int. And you might say, well, why didn't I store that as a double? And that'd be a good question, right? Because int, you know, age is a, actually a continuous quantity, but let's just say we stored it as an int. We made that design decision. Maybe for this particular program, it's not important exactly how old somebody is. I just wanna know what their age is in years, not years, days, hours, minutes, and seconds. Okay, so that is the state that the object stores. Every object of type person that I create will store a name and an age. 
It'll have a name and an age. So again, you know, this is maybe, you know, something that, um, you know, doesn't excite you as much as it should, because look, up until this point, we've been just forced to deal with these single pieces of data. If I wanted to store information about a person, I wouldn't have been able to do anything remotely like this. I would have had to store, like, their name as one variable and their age as a second variable. And then I'd have to always remember to pass them around to functions. If I wanted to store multiple people, I need a raise of both of them. It gets ugly very quickly. Now, I'm actually designing a new type in the language. I'm saying, hey, I'm gonna work with some data about people. And here's the information that every person has to have for my program. Now, obviously, people have a lot more than just a name and an age. So it's a lot of other attributes that you might want to store about a person. But maybe for the particular program that I'm writing, this is enough. So you get to make choices about sort of which data, can we not talk over here, guys? There's like constant chatter coming from this part of the room. I'd like that to stop. Thanks. All right, so, but when you design the person class, you get to choose what data you want to store about each person. Okay. Then following that, I have my first method definition. So now I'm saying that every person can do the following thing. I'm establishing behaviors that are associated with this class. So here's one. This is a behavior, it's a function. It's a method. You guys have been writing these as part of the homework. You're not gonna write them alone anymore, now you're gonna write them as part of a class. But you've written these already. These implement algorithms. This is a very simple one, right? This one says just print that person's name to standard out. So I just use my familiar system dot out, dot println, and I use some special syntax there that we're gonna talk about in a minute to access the name of that object, whatever object is running that method. That's it. When you look at more complicated class definitions, you typically find just more of the same thing. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about some places where things get slightly more complicated and I can do some, some interesting things, but this is the root of it. So more complicated classes in Java have, typically will have store more pieces of data, sometimes not. Think about a string. A string only stores an array of characters, one piece of data, but if you looked at the definition for a string, you'd find many, many, many methods. Okay. The class, so again, a class doesn't represent an instance of the class. That's an object. You can think of the class, one analogy that I think is somewhat helpful, although I try to stay away from these as much as possible, is that the class is sort of like a blueprint. So a blueprint is not a house. A blueprint tells you how to build a particular type of house. If you take that blueprint and execute it faithfully, which of course Java will, you'll get a house. And then if you execute it again, you'll get another house. Right, so the blueprint determines how a particular type of object is going to be structured. Now again, each instance of a class or each object can store a different name and a different age. But the class sets up a structure that all instances of that class are required to follow. So every person has a name and an age. Okay. So again, every instance of an object class person so every object that's of type person will have a instance variable name that's a string. I also have an instance variable age that's an int. And, so that's its state and its behavior is, it'll have a method called print name that takes no arguments, returns nothing, and prints the name of that object in the string. So one of the things about Java that makes it interesting and one of the restrictions about Java that makes it useful, although sometimes frustrating, is that in Java, once you have a particular class that you've established and you've compiled your code, you can't make changes to it later. You can change the name of an instance of class person. But as your code is running, you can't suddenly decide, oh wait, I think person should also have a birthday. I'm just gonna add that as my program runs. If I want to make that change, I actually have to change the class definition and then recompile my code. Now there's a reason for this. Other languages, Python, JavaScript, um, some interpreted languages will allow you to make changes like this at runtime. That can be a little terrifying. 
it can cause problems. Java doesn't allow me to do that. If you decide later that you need to model more information about a person, you can change the class definition, but you have to recompile your code, and then, you know, for example, if you had an app, you would have to redistribute a new version of the app. You may think that this is frustrating um, when you're writing small programs. It turns out to be really, really helpful when you're debugging and working with larger pieces of software. Because you have a guarantee. If I give you any instance of a type person, I know things about it. I know that it has a name. I know that it has an age. Okay, so now we get to finally talk about new, which has been kind of, you know, messing with us for the last couple weeks. We didn't really exactly know what was going on. So now I have this blueprint, I have this class definition, how do I actually create an instance of that class that I can use to store information? So I have a blueprint that says this particular type, this particular class is gonna represent or store this following data and it's also gonna have these behaviors, but how do I actually create one so that I can give it a name and an actual age? So an object, you know, again, an instance of a class, or sometimes we'll just use object, for this in Java, or an instance, sometimes I'll use them interchangeably, is an object that has been created according to a particular class declaration. So I said, here's what a person class looks like, and then I'm gonna create one. The way I create a new object is I use a special keyword called new, right? So here's Right here, one to seven, this is my definition of the person class. It tells me what its state and behavior are. And then on line eight, I'm actually creating a new instance of class, of a class, the class of type person. Now this looks pretty similar to other variable declarations and initializations we've already seen. Over here, on the left side, I'm saying Java, I wanna work with a variable called Jeffrey that's of type person. Variable name, variable type. Once I start defining my own custom types, I can use them in the place of a normal type declaration as part of an initialization. That's what they are, right? This is equivalent to an int or a char or a string. Now on the right side, unlike an int or a char, I do need this special new keyword. It's actually a literal and figurative new keyword. So I use this word new that says to Java, create a new instance of this class. And then I have the name of the class and something that looks like an empty method declaration. And for now, we're gonna ignore that, but we are gonna come back and talk about that very soon, on Wednesday. So after line eight executes, Jeffrey is an instance of, it's a variable of type person. So I can set its name and I can set its age, right? So again, let's try to get the terminology straight here because it's important. Person with a capital P is a class. It's a type of Java object. Jeffrey, in this example, is an instance of that class or sometimes just an object, an object of type person. All right, dot notation. So how do we get, we know that objects combine state and behavior, but how do we access that state and behavior? Again, some of this you've seen already with strings and with arrays, but you didn't really understand what you were doing. Now, hopefully, this makes more sense. So the dot notation is what allows me to access the properties and methods of an object, of an instance of a class. So here on line eight, I've created my instance of class person called Jeffrey. Now I have a variable called Jeffrey, so I have one person and I can set that person's age using the syntax on line nine. I take the name of the object, Jeffrey, dot, and then the name of one of its instance variables. So one of the pieces of state that are defined as part of that object. So I defined name and age. Here I'm using dot age to set the age of this particular person. And on the right side, I've got a literal, right? Age is an int defined in my class, and so I can set it with an int literal. Once that's set, I can then init I can then print it, right? So let's try this together and make sure that it does, oh, this one's still wrong. I've aged a bit, so it typically happens, all right. Here we go. I 
could also set my name here as well. Let's do that. Let's say Jeffrey dot name is equal to, nobody likes that, but that's fine, right? And now down here I can print name, there you go. If I try to access something that I haven't declared, I get a compiler error. Again, this is one of the places where Java is helpful. And if you try to do this in IntelliJ, it won't even let you do that. There'll be a big, angry, red squiggly there being like, instance of class person does not have, you know, instance variable foo, right? Um, you know, Java also makes sure that my assignments conform to the, um, right? So, same thing here. Now I'm using a, a, a double literal, but age is an int. And so I get a warning very similar to the way, way that I would uh, get a warning if I tried to set um, just, uh, you know, a local variable of type int. All right. Any questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, good question. Good, good, good bit of review. So, what does this mean here on the left part of print name? Anyone remember? So what goes to the left of a method or a function declaration? Yeah. A return type, and what does void mean? Yeah. It means what? It means it doesn't return anything. So a void method cannot return anything. So if I try to return something from a void method, let's try to return an int, it's not going to compile. Um, if I try to set something to the result, let's use print name, actually. Let's do uh, jeffrey.printName. Okay. Oh, still mad at me about that, let's get rid of it. Ah, okay, so this is actually really interesting, and we're gonna come back to that in a second. So let's set my name. So what I like to be called, and then we'll print it, we'll call the print name function, which does the same thing. And now let's try to save the result of that. I can't do it, right? So void is a special type. The only place it's used is in a method declaration to indicate that method doesn't return anything. I can't create a variable of type void because what would the point be, right? Can't set it to anything. That would actually be amusing if Java would let you do that. I could just declare void variables just because I wanted to have a variable called whatever, you know? I can't do that. Um, only place I can use void is here. Okay. So one of the things I want to point out, so we talked before about the, inst the, the primitive types in Java, those eight primitive types being the building blocks with which we were gonna then use to build more complicated pieces of, of data, to model data. You know, as a, I just want to remind you of something. As computer scientists, you know, there's this, all this buzz about data science and stuff like that. Okay. As computer scientists, you are already data scientists, right? That's what a computer scientist is, plus some other stuff, right? Don't forget that. You guys work with data all the time. You will spend the rest of your career working with data. Don't feel intimidated when someone says they're a data scientist. Say, oh, okay, yeah, me too. I'm a computer scientist. Um, but how do we work with more complex data in Java? Well, we have these primitive types. But now, I can design objects that combine multiple instances of those primitive types together. And then it turns out that my objects, my classes, can also contain variables that are themselves objects. So I can nest things, so I can have a class declaration that includes instances of other classes. In fact, we already just saw that, right? Person, my person class, one of the instance variables age is a primitive type, but the other one is an object. Strings are objects, that's why they're capitalized. So here I've got a class that combines two fields, two pieces of data, one's a primitive type, and then another one is itself a class, and then if you look inside a string, what are you gonna find? An array of characters. So I promised you before, if you drill down far enough, eventually you get to primitive types. You can start with any object declaration in Java, and if you break it down, break it down, break it down, follow it all the way down, you're gonna find yourself to primitive types. So here's just another example. In a lot of cases, this is useful. 
So here's an example of I'm storing, maybe I'm building a program to allow people to, you know, um, create a schematic for a way to put furniture in a room or something like that, okay? Um, and I've got a room class that's supposed to represent information about the room. My program will have multiple rooms. Every room has a name. Remember, that name is another object. And then here, I could say, oh, the room has a height and a width. But what I've decided to do is I've decided to represent height and width themselves as a separate class, as a dimension class. Why would I do that? That just seems more complicated. Why not just have every room have a height and a width? That would probably also work, at least at the beginning. Yeah. So, so the, the answer was if I have a bunch of different rooms, but if I have a bunch of different rooms, everyone will have its own height and width. So that's okay. That'll still work. Why take dimensions here and create a separate object? Yeah. What's that? Okay. I could have an area method on my uh, room class that returned the area of the room. That's a good question, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so it's possible that other things also have a dimension like a piece of furniture. So my furniture class, so as I was writing this program, probably what you would do normally is, well, you would start by saying, okay, my room has a height and a width. But then you have a separate class for a piece of furniture. And you're like, oh gosh, this also has a height and a width. So now I'm starting to repeat myself. Um, and so by creating this dimension class, now everything that has a dimension can use this. And if I need to do something like co compute the area, I'll add it to the dimension class. This will make more sense as we go along. All right. If I need to set the value of something inside an object, I use, I can continue to use dot notation. So I can use dot notation to follow an object past, so, you know, to take one object and to access, you know, other uh, methods or uh, variables of objects that it contains. Well, let's put in something so we know what happened here. All right, good. So what am I doing here? So dining room, so I have an instance of room here that I've declared. And then notice, so I wanna point something else out to you that's important here, because this will motivate a little bit of our discussion on Wednesday. So after I create, let me get rid of this. Okay. I've created an instance of my dining room. What's the value of dimensions going to be right after this finish is executed? Let's find out. Okay, who thinks it's gonna, well, who thinks that Java's already automatically gonna set up like a dimensions object for us with, you know, so that would be nice, right? And Java's not so nice. Let's see what happens here, right? So let's print the value of dining room dot dimensions. Null. Ah, okay. So that scary magic value that indicates nothing. This is one of the places where null trips people up, is uninitialized object variables. So for example, if I forgot to initialize dimensions, and then I came down here in my program and I said, okay, uh, what's the width of the room? Now I have one of these really nasty null pointer exceptions a runtime error that will cause a crash that somebody will notice. All right. Uh, we will talk about how to address this problem next time. So again, in Java, this objects open up the type system. They are your key into the type system in Java. Java gives you some starting points, these primitive types, and then you're off to the races once you know how to use objects. Classes in Java should not be something that scare you. Unfortunately, you know, because of how we grade your assignments, it's not always straightforward for us to give you practice at doing this. And this is something that I've thought about a little bit. I just don't have a good solution for you in terms of how we structure this class. 
Um, normally, when we have you design classes, we're gonna tell you what we want. Because if we don't tell you, we can't test your code, right? So if I say, okay, design a person class, I've gotta tell you what the names of the variables are and stuff like that. So I apologize for that, because we're essentially kind of limiting the creativity that you guys can express. But when you're actually, so when you guys get to your final project, and when you get out in the real world and you're writing real programs, a lot of what you spend time doing is thinking about how to model the data that you're working with. What pieces of it should you store? What should you call them? How do you initialize it? Where does it come from? Where does it go? You know, so, you know, in a lot of the code that we've written for this to support this class, for example, if you talk to some of the course developers, they'll say, yeah, I mean, we spend a lot of time designing classes, designing objects, designing new types. Right? Um, partly because a lot of those choices are up to you once you're, you know, once there's no auto grader to satisfy. Um, let me give you a little bit of a preview about where we go with this. So, you know, those of you that have, you know, I think by now pretty much everybody is working on MP0. Many of you are done. Congratulations. Um, but you had to write on MP0, this incredibly sad function, all right? Maybe writing it made you sad. Um, but the thing that's sad about this is actually not that you had to write it, okay? One of the TAs for the class, like, went through the MP and was like, oh my gosh, what are you guys doing? This could target within range. Like, it takes, like, eight arguments, right? Okay? But up until now, you didn't know about objects, so this is the best we could do, okay? So I'm sorry that we forced you to do this. Hopefully you'll get a chance to fix it, right? So why is the method signature of this particular function so awful? Well, because the only thing that we were, you were allowed to work with on MP0, the first MP checkpoint, was primitive types. And so if you want to represent latitude and longitude of position, that's fundamentally at least two variables, maybe even three if you represent height, altitude off the Earth's surface, okay? So a function like this has to take an array of latitudes, an array of longitudes, a path, and then a current longitude and a current latitude, okay? How can we clean this up, all right? So, you know, again, is this, this approach is sometimes known as synchronized indices. And please forget that as soon as you saw it, because we will not do this again, right? But what does that mean? It means that the, uh, the value of doubles i is associated with the, sorry, the value of latitudes i is associated with the values of longitudes i, okay? So what we really want here, this is one place where opening up Java's class system, be able to design our own type produces a dramatic improvement in the quality of this code, okay? We want a location type that stores a longitude and a latitude. This is a piece of data in the world that's more complicated than just a series of data points, okay? This is a, uh, this is a particular type of data. It's not hard to model. It just has, needs two doubles, all right? So here it is. Okay? Sorry, there's a bug on this slide. Let me see if it got fixed yet. Just reload this guy. Oh, not yet, okay. Anyway, ignore the, this, this is from last semester. Okay? But imagine I have this class. I can design my own classes now. You know, I know how to use, I'm starting to learn how to use objects in Java. I know that I can use them to represent more complex data than I can represent with just single or series of values of the primitive types. So what I've done, is I've created a location class. Every location has, again, at minimum, a latitude and a longitude. And then I can also put an is valid flag on there, right, to indicate whether or not this longitude and latitude makes sense. Maybe you gave me values that are outside of the range of valid lat long, right? There are limits on you know, there are, so there's a range of valid latitudes and longitudes, and if you create a location with invalid ones, I'll check and I'll set that to false. We'll show you how to do that next time. So now, look down at the bottom and look at this, uh, look at how much cleaner this becomes, okay? 
Remember before, actually it was worse. I had the array of latitudes, the array of longitudes, and then a third array, the path, that was, had indices in it that guided me through the first two arrays. So that was terrible, all right? Instead, what I do now is I just give you the path as a series of location measurements. All that data Google's collecting about you, a lot of it's in this form. Series of location measurements, right? Um, you know, usually there's probably a timestamp associated with them, too. Then I give you another location. That's the current location. That's where you are right now. Again, I don't have to give you a latitude and a longitude, current, lat, current, long. I just give you one location object. So this is why. This is, you know, just one example. And you can imagine how the rest of this function goes. And doing some of this cleanup is something that I think is part of MP1. Right? So on some level, objects are one of our first data structures, right? Um, you know, formerly known as records, but objects, you know, because they combine state and behavior, uh, they go past this a little bit. Okay. So, last thing we're gonna talk about today is this idea of an instance method. So we've talked, up until this point, we've been largely concerned with the data that an object can store. But objects can also do things. That's one of the things that's fun about them. The instance methods are part of the class declaration. So every object of that class can perform certain actions. It can implement certain behavior. So here, going back to our dimensions class, is an example of me adding a feature to every dimensions object. I might say, hey, it would be nice if the dimensions object would know how to calculate its own area, just in case I forget. And indeed, I can do that very easily. Now, we're seeing a new piece of syntax here. Well, let's, let's sure, make sure this works first. Okay, seems like it works. Um, let me create an instance with different dimensions and make sure it's still working. Okay, good. So state and behavior. Let's say, um, let's see, let's do this. Boolean is portrait. I need to be able to spell portrait. And I'll say return this dot width is greater than this dot height. So, you know, if I was looking at this and the width was along the bottom, the height was along the top, this is in portrait orientation. So this is more appropriate for a photograph, maybe, right? So now I can say, this is how I add a piece of state to an existing variable, right? So now the width, actually, is that right? No, it's the other way around. If the height is greater than the width, right? So as I went along and I was working on my program, there might be other things that I needed every dimensions to be able to do, and I can add them that easily, okay? So let me uh, briefly talk about this special um, new keyword called this that we just saw. So when an instance method runs, it r I can only call an instance when I have a, ins I can only call an instance method when I have an instance of that class. So whenever an instance method runs, it's accessing the values of the variables on that particular instance of the class. And one way to do that is to use this keyword called this. So whenever an instance method runs, this refers to me, that object, okay? So let me go back here, let's just, this is gonna be silly, but let's make something called void print width, and we'll say system.out.println this.width. And then we'll do example.printWidth. So that's gonna print 10. Let me create a new dimensions object, and then let's set it to 20. I'll call it second. And now, let's print second.println. Oh, I said example again. So second, second, I'm sending second instance variables, perfect. So at this point, I have two different dimensions objects. They are independent from each other. If I change the width of one, it doesn't change the width of the other. Let me prove that to you by printing the width of the first example again. 
All right, so we will come back and talk about this a little bit more. Oh, look at that, I just did that one. Awesome. All right. Okay, so we'll come back and do some object modeling next time. On Wednesday, we're gonna talk about constructors. But the midterm starts today. I wish you guys the best of luck. A quick reminder about format, 12 multiple choice questions on code reading, three programming questions. The programming questions do have partial credit. There is one on arrays, one on multidimensional arrays, and one that uses strings. String documentation is provided as part of the cover sheet for the exam. Good luck. I wish you guys the best of luck. You guys are doing really well. Um, and one of the practice problems, one of the quiz questions is up on the practice problem set. All right? Good luck on the midterm. MP1 will be released to everybody tonight. The blue team already has it. Uh, good luck to the orange team finishing up MP0. I will see you all on Wednesday.